Greetings, I bid to Madam Shirley. I am Damia, and today our group will be presenting for PHY370 video presentation entitled Material Science, which is Material Characterization. Before I begin, let me introduce my team members. This team consists of three members, including me, Nick Dayang Damia Kaisara, student ID 20216168584, Nur Husna Maisara Jamil 20216061102, and Nur Shasha Natasha. 2021491184. In this topic, we will be covering for three parts, which is X-ray diffraction technique, scanning electron microscope, and infrared spectroscopy. Assalamualaikum and greetings. My name is Nur Husna Masara binti Jamil, student ID 2021606102, and today I will be talking about X-ray diffraction technique. So what is this diffraction? Diffraction is a wave phenomenon in which the apparent bending and spreading of waves with the median obstruction. It occurs with electromagnetic waves such as radio waves, sound waves, and water waves. Light diffraction is caused by light bending around the edge of an object. There are two types of diffraction phenomena, which are constructive interference and destructive interference. Constructive interference is the result of synchronized light waves that add together to increase the light intensity. While destructive interference results when two out of phase light waves cancel each other out, resulting in darkness. Next is X-ray sources. But first, we will go through the X-ray properties. X-ray is invisible, highly penetrating electromagnetic radiation of much shorter wavelength than visible light. The wavelength range for X-rays is about 10 to the power of negative 8 meter to about 10 to the power of negative 11 meter, and the corresponding frequency range is about 3 exponent 16 hertz to about 3 exponent 19 hertz. So how is X-ray produced? Invisible light photons and X-ray photons are both produced by the movement of electrons in atoms. Electrons occupy different energy levels, or orbitals around an atom's nucleus. When an electron drops to a lower orbital, it needs to release some energy, which will be released in the form of a photon. The energy level of the photon depends on how far the electron dropped between orbitals. In this case, X-rays can be produced in a highly evacuated glass bulb called an X-ray tube that contains essentially two electrons, an anode made of platinum, tungsten, or another heavy metal of high melting point, and a cathode. When a high voltage is applied between the electrodes, streams of electrons in the cathode rays are accelerated from the cathode to the anode and produce X-rays as they strike the anode. Bragg's law, which was proposed by William Lawrence Bragg, a famous physicist, considered crystals to be made up of parallel plants of atoms. Incident waves are reflected specularly from parallel plants of atoms in the crystal, with each plane is reflecting only a very small fraction of the radiation, like a slightly silvered mirror. He also identifies the angles of incident radiation relative to the lattice planes for which diffraction peaks occurs. Bragg's equation states that 2d sine theta equals to n lambda, where d is the interplanar spacing and n is the order of diffraction, and n lambda has to be less than or equals to 2d. Bragg's law applies to all sets of crystal planes. For cubic structures, d equals to a divided by square root of h squared plus k squared and l squared. My name is Nur Shasha Natasha and I am going to present about scanning electron microscope. So what is scanning electron microscope? The scanning electron microscope generates a signal that reveals information about a specimen's external morphology, chemical composition, and crystalline structure by using a focused high energy electron beam. Typically, data is collected over a specific surface area, usually yielding a two-dimension image with spatial variations, with magnifications ranging from 20 to 30,000 times and spatial resolution ranging from 50 to 100 nanometer. SEM can image areas ranging from 1 centimeter to 5 microns. It allows for the qualitative or semi-quantitative determination of chemical compositions, crystal structure, and crystal orientation using point analysis. The SEM shares similarities with EPMA, offering overlapping capabilities between the two instruments. So next is the fundamental principle of scanning electron microscope. 
So, accelerated electrons in scanning electron microscope have a high kinetic energy and they produce a variety of signals when they interact with the sample. So these signals also include secondary electrons, which is morphology, backscattered electrons, diffracted backscattered electrons, characteristic X-rays, visible light, and heat. Usually, secondary and backscattered electrons are frequently used for imaging, with secondary electrons focusing on morphology and topography, Meanwhile, backscattered electrons highlighting composition contrast in multiphase samples. In elastic collisions, produce characteristic X-rays specific to each element, which is resulting in X-ray generation. SEM analysis is a non-restrictive, allowing for multiple examinations of the same material with no sample volume loss. The instrumentation of scanning electron microscope. So important components of all SEMs include the following, which is electron source, also known as gun, electron lenses, sample stage detectors for all signals of interest, and display or data output devices. So the infrastructure requirements are power supply, vacuum system, cooling system, vibration-free floor, and room free of ambient, magnetic, and electric fields. So this is the diagram of the scanning electron uh, microscope instrumentations. Applications of scanning electron microscope. So SEM is used to obtain elemental maps or spot chemical analysis using EDS and using BSE to distinguish phases based on mean atomic number. SEM also create, creating compositional maps based on variation in trace elements activators. So SEM aids in phase identification using qualitative chemical analyze, analysis and precise measurement of small features down to 50 nanometers. Backscattered electron images distinguish phases quickly, while EBSD equipped SEMs investigate microfabric and crystallographic orientation in materials. What are the strengths and limitations of scanning electron microscope? So, for the strength of SEM, SEM is essential in all fields that require solid material characterizations. Most SEMs are relatively simple to use with user-friendly intuitive interfaces. Many applications require very little sample preparations. Data acquisition is also quick, which is less than 5 minutes per image for many applications. Data from modern SEMs is generated in digital formats that are highly portable. However, for the limitations of SEMs, SEMs solid sample must fit within a 10 cm horizontal and 4 mm vertical limit and be stable in vacuum. Unsuitable samples include those that outgas or degrade. For such applications, however, low vacuum SEMs are available. Light elements and elements with atomic numbers less than 11 are not detectable by, ed by EDS detectors. SEMs employ fast but insensitive solid state detectors, which electrically insulating samples require conductive coating unless the SEM operates in low vacuum. Sample collection and preparation. The acquisition of a sample that will fit into the SEM chamber and some accommodation to prevent charge buildup on electrically insulating samples constitute minimal preparation. The majority of electrically insulating samples are coated with a thin layer conducting material, which is typically carbon, gold, or another metal or alloy. The material used for conductive coatings is determined by the data to be collected. 
for example, carbon is best for elemental analysis, while metal coatings is best for high-resolution electron imaging applications. Alternatively, an electrically insulating sample can be examined without a conductive coating in a low vacuum operation. So here are some representative SEN images from asbestiform minerals. Greetings again, I bid to Madam Shirley. My name is Nick Dayang Damia Kaisara, student ID 20216168540, and I will be covering for infrared spectroscopy in this video. What is IR? IR is the study of light in the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum which has a longer wavelength and a lower frequency than visible light. The concept of IR spectroscopy may be analyzed in three ways, which is by measuring reflection, emission, and absorption, with absorption spectroscopy being the most common. Next, what is FTIR? FTIR stands for Fourier Transform Infrared can be used to identify and study chemicals. It is a technique to study the interaction of molecules with infrared light. Next, these are the components of FTIR, which includes source, interferometer, sample compartment, detector, amplifier, eddy converter, and followed by computer. Now, let's look at how does FTIR works. To start off, a source produces infrared radiation that passes the sample through the interferometer and reaches the detector. Afterward, the signal undergoes amplification and it is subsequently transformed into a digital signal through the use of an amplifier and an analog to digital converter, respectively. Ultimately, the signal is transmitted to a computer where Fourier transform is executed. What is the goal for absorption? To measure how well a sample absorbs light at each wavelength. How? To shine a monochromatic laser beam at a sample, measure how much light is absorbed, then repeat for each different wavelength. FTIR shines a beam that is generated by starting with a broadband light source, one containing the full spectrum of wavelengths to be measured containing many frequencies of light at once and how much of that beam absorbed by the sample is measured. Next, the light enters a Michelson interferometer which is a specific configuration of mirrors, one of which is moved by a motor. Because of wave interference, when this mirror moves, each wavelength of light in the beam is periodically blocked, transmitted block, transmitted by the interferometer. Different wavelengths are modulated at different rates. Thus, the beam coming out of the interferometer has a distinct spectrum at any given time. To convert the raw data, which is light absorption for each mirror position, into the result of light absorption for each wavelength, computer processing is necessary. The processing requires the use of a popular method known as the Fourier transform. An interferogram is a term used to describe the raw data. In conclusion, FTI analysis is a failure analysis technique that offers information on chemical bonding or molecular structure. It is used in failure analysis to detect unknown materials present in a specimen and is frequently performed in conjunction with energy dispersive X ray, which is EDX analysis. FTIR spectroscopy, unlike SEM inspection or EDX analysis, does not require a vacuum since neither oxygen nor nitrogen absorb infrared radiation. FTIR analysis may be used on very small amounts of materials, whether solid, liquid, or gases. Individual peaks in the FTIR plot may be utilized to offer partial information about the specimen if the library of FTIR spectral patterns does not provide a suitable match. With that, I thank you. These are some of the references that we use in completing this video. Thank you for watching.